Hey everyone, it's Wednesday, April 27th, 2022. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. My name is Weston Nakamura, and I am joined once again today by Mr. Darius Dale, founder and CEO of 42 Macro. What's Darius, up, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, man. You should have told me you were wearing a suit. I wouldn't have worn one myself, but I would have definitely known. <laughs> suit, this is These are my pajamas. This is how I sleep. So. <laughs> You're always ready to go, man. Really appreciate yeah. you guys you checking in on uh, Japanese hours. I know it's tough. Uh, I mean, it's global hours, right? So uh, it's all global good. Hours. Now, you, usually, um, you know, the last few times you and I get together, it's because Japan had blown up that day. Mm -hmm. um, however... This time is different. Um, <laughs> we might actually uh, be front running a potential blowing up in Japan, or maybe not. The reason I'm saying that is because tomorrow uh, we have a BOJ Bank of Japan monetary policy meeting, which is probably the first one that's been in focus um, in, in, in years. years. <laughs> in years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'll we'll touch on that um, in you know in in a in a moment, um, but. Uh, for now, just you know, just taking a look at markets um, as we're you know kind of closing up here. It looks like you know U.S. indices for the most part ended up uh, more or less flat on the day, giving up some you know incremental gains. Europe closed uh, positive. Uh, in Asia, you had um, a reversal in the Chinese indices and Chinese stock markets um, to the upside, um, but again, this was following pretty severe sell-offs um, happening uh, over the last several days. Uh, which we can get into uh, as well. So, um, you know, this is the pre-BOJ um, meeting and or meeting day, rather. And so, you know, we're going to touch on that. But Darius, I, I just want to talk to you about China. Oh, yeah. Because I know you, you've been, uh, you know, certainly uh, all of this. So market price action, you know, we've seen, let's just start with the currency. The yuan had been getting just killed. Um you know, since really last Friday or so, we've been seeing like two consecutive days of one percent moves on on USD CNY, which is which is huge for a you know a managed currency. Um, and you know, like minus three percent over over a three four day span. Um, those are those are some very serious moves. So, what are you seeing in and and then, then of course the equity indices too have been selling off, and then they had a sort of short squeeze rebound today on. Uh, headlines of like sort of infrastructure um, from President Xi. So just give me your kind of your view on on what you see uh, happening in China right now. Yeah, let me let's take a step back and kind of paint the picture for those who may be new to the Chinese economic situation. Um, obviously, the world's second largest economy, but not many investors sort of follow it with the same rigor, uh, analytical rigor that they do the U.S. and other economies. So the Chinese economy has been cyclically slowing uh, since the early part of 2021. Um, they are sort of towards the tail end of their cyclical slowdown, at least according to our models. But by that by that admission, uh, they are certainly in the lowest level of the activity that we've seen. And part of the reason we're seeing such low levels of activity in China um, there is a function of their zero COVID policy. Um, so they have the entire city of Shanghai more or less completely locked down right now. That's their largest city by GDP and population. Obviously, Beijing being one of the um, top three cities by GDP and population. Um, they're actually rumored to uh, potentially be ramping up testing that could potentially lead to a lockdown of Beijing. We're not there yet, um, but it's certainly an issue uh, as it relates to the very near term Chinese growth outlook. I mean, if we're you know talking about this, you know, two, three months later. I don't think any of this will be relevant anymore, but certainly from a very near term perspective, it's it's a big deal. And so as a function of the Chinese growth sort of metrics, you know, whether you look at hard data, um, whether you look at expectations, GDP estimates continue to get slashed across uh, economist consensus, or whether you just look at it from a market standpoint, Shanghai Composite hit a two-year low before rebounding uh, this morning. You know, the markets, the, the economists, and, and pretty much everyone out there understands that Chinese the growth outlook in China uh, is very challenged. And so as a function of that, there have been a lot of uh, calls from investors uh, to for the PBOC and for the Beijing, for Chinese fiscal authorities to uh, ramp up stimulus. Um, and there have been actually sort of um, you know rhetoric out of the out of those entities in supporting some of those calls. Um, you go back a few weeks ago, uh, we had Lee Kishan come out and say they need to do more to step up uh, uh, policies to promote the stock market. Then, like a couple weeks after that, or a week after that, 
Uh, they, in fact, they push the, um, you know, the kind of the central regime, which is kind of the entity that owns all these sort of state assets in China to buy more stocks, to buy more support Chinese asset markets and and also to send a signal to uh, Chinese asset managers. And then most recently uh, this morning, we got President Xi Jinping out with a sort of pledge to uh, promote uh, to step up infrastructure investment um, as a, to counter the growth slowdown, which ironically is partially his fault as a function of the, the COVID policy. And so we're here today trying to figure out what what is the most likely outcome from a economic and and more importantly monetary and fiscal easing standpoint in China. So happy to unpack that. Yeah, um, let's actually just you know um, address the kind of the 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 policy steps before the actual you know the policy steps he's taken before the kind of job owning um, measures, if you will. Uh, oh, yeah. But most recently, what they did was. Um, so I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Darius, but it was uh, two days ago or three days ago, uh, but the official stepped in and um, what they did in light of this falling yuan was that they raised the, I'm sorry, they, they lowered the uh, foreign exchange reserve ratio for banks uh, by 1% uh, down to 8%. Mm-hmm. Um, that's starting in, mid- in mid-May. And, and that is basically what that does is, you know, it, it's you know if it's it's to reduce like the requirements to hold domestic currency and that should basically you know dampen the desire to to hold foreign currency USD for example mm-hmm. um, and therefore support the uh, the yuan and that actually did have that market outcome that they uh, had had intended for now the 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 kind of problem with that um, with with doing that is that last year in 2021. Um, the FX reserve ratio, this this uh, this rate, they raised it twice, and at that time they did so um, by citing, you know, that they're they're trying to combat yuan strength, um, mm-hmm. and they were also saying at the time that yuan strength, um, you know, that this is market forces driven. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, not anymore as of two two days ago. So that goes against you know that. But um, so so that, I guess that's kind of like a hybrid between actual sort of policy implementation as well as some some job owning going on but well let's be let's go take a step back they, they did yeah. ease policy to a slight degree by the sort of Iran devaluation that we saw over the weekend um it was nothing to sort of write home about in terms of you know where we've been in historical bond depreciation cycles but it was a big pit move relative where we had been trending um certainly from a realized volatility perspective and also a levels perspective we pretty much gapped up Let's call it from you know just above six to six sixty or just under six sixty on the USD and USD CNY or USD CNH, and so that move you're discussing now was effectively to release capital to allow Chinese banks to sell dollars on behalf of their clients and sort of cap the you know sort of put a floor under the depreciation cycle. And so it's my interpretation that the the you know sort of the monetary authorities, the PBOC and and the fiscal authority in China effectively did that sort of slight devaluation kind of as a shot across the bow to their sort of counterpart across the across the pond in Japan to say, hey, look, you continue to allow the yen to depreciate at this pace, we're going it's going to have implications because we're going to do what we need to do to maintain our competitiveness. Obviously, Japan is probably China's number one principal sort of uh, export uh, competitor, if you will. Um, and certainly the implications of the yuan. The reason we're having this discussion, by the way, is because historically we've seen going back to 2015, 2016 is the kind of the most recent major example of yuan depreciation having a massive impact on global asset markets. And the reason it has a massive impact on global asset markets um, is because sometimes it can be coincide with disinflation cycles. Brian, if you pull up that chart, uh, yuan devaluation chart I sent you, um, you can kind of see what I mean. Um, there's, so there have been sort of three kind of yuan devaluation episodes. There have been uh, sorry, let me tell you this about there have been six sort of disinflation episodes kind of since the global financial crisis um, in the U.S. and global economies. Three of them have coincided with, you know, sort of managed depreciations in the Chinese yuan. And that makes sense, right? You know, China's the world's largest sort of export or, or in terms of, you know, import um, demand. You know, China's the number one um, exporter to the U.S. at about 18 percent of total imports. It's the number one exporter to the EU at about 20 percent of total imports. So obviously the price of the yuan and the what uh, Chinese yuan goods are being priced in on a relative on a dollar swap basis clearly has an impact on the inflation cycle. So that's why a lot of investors were so very concerned about this, because a lot of folks would have been offsides being long kind of reflation 
or inflation, the two regimes associated with inflation accelerating in terms of those exposures. And a lot of folks are just simply not positioned for deflation or disinflation at this particular juncture. So we saw a lot of pain on Monday uh, from a lot of different accounts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just that just to remind people that August 2015 deval, that was that was huge. Um, that was nasty. You know, that that was cross asset volatility uh, across the board. Um, mm -hmm. And and it was just from just from, you know, uh, really not that big of a, of a devaluation, but basically it was the, the signal uh, that that was sent. Um, and that's that kind of, you know, that that kind of almost accidental firepower that they have. Um, yeah. You know that that when by which what I mean by that is it's almost like when they're trying to actually instill a, a you know a policy or job on a policy in or uh, you know a market uh, desired outcome in they find temporary success at best. Uh, on the other hand, when they use so, you know some of their monetary tools, um, they can you know they're basically bringing uh you know uh, uh, an axe to a you know uh like a surgery right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. A, a samurai blade to a to a, to a surgery i mean then that that's been the history of chinese uh, monetary and fiscal policy responses to growth slowdowns uh, brian if you pull up that uh, other chart i say you're in china three months shy bore versus the china credit impulse you know this is you know kind of let's let's set the stage if you will for why we're here today and so the reason china is sort of slow to this place it's because the PBOC, the Chinese Beijing, the, the sort of state council has been unwilling to sort of do the broad base, wide scale, physical infrastructure style stimulus that we've become associated with in previous Chinese reflation cycles. I mean, if you go back and look at the kind of the last five um, big easing cycles we've seen in China, as denoted by the charts, the red dotted line, the blue dotted lines in those charts are kind of the beginning and end of those easing cycles. You know, right, if you compare it to today, you'll see, you'll notice that, hey, look, We've hardly seen any easing in the Chinese financial sector, um, you know, kind of in recent months. You know, we've only seen a 25 basis point decline uh, in three months shy bore year to date. The reason I track three months shy bore is because PBOC has a variety of tools that it uses to sort of um, control the, the cost of money and availability of credit in the, in, the PB, in the Chinese financial sector. It's got open market operations, medium term lending, triple R, reserve requirement ratios, you know, different other ratios and loan prime rates, et cetera. So the three months shy bore, given that about 80, 85 percent of all private non financial sector in China is on bank balance sheet, sort of more or less, you know, it captures all those, you know, kind of moving parts in totality. And historically speaking, when you've seen these sort of massive easing cycles in China, the kind you need to be afraid of as a bear, to be very clear, you typically have seen already kind of two to 300 basis points of easing in three months shy bore as a function of all those other moving parts. Well, we've only seen really 25 basis points of easing thus far, and it's certainly not enough, in our opinion, to get the Chinese economy meaningfully resuscitated uh, in any kind of sort of, you know, systemic, systemic reflation that would sort of catalyze, you know, kind of a, you know, different outlook from a, from a medium term asset market response perspective. Yeah. So what do you make of the fact that they kind of, you know, like, so take loan prime rate um, that they that they left unchanged, um, that they're not really doing anything in that in that realm, but they're, I've never seen job owning like this. I, I don't mean just from China, from like, from anyone, like, you know, you were talking about earlier, um, if this was like, this was a day of March FOMC when they just came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they basically just did this verbal intervention in, in the equity markets, like explicitly saying, for and long only investors add to your shareholdings. This is market bottom um, and flipped on every single sort of thing that they had um, every single cloud that was overhanging, uh, you know, Chinese uh, equity markets, be it um, the tech regulatory crackdown, the, you know, the Evergrande and the, you know, the property sector deleveraging, the, all of that just kind of flipped on a dime. So they'll, they'll do that. But then actually when it comes to the actual like policy, they, they're, they're on hold. What do you make of those like that kind of di divergence? Um, yeah. So, I mean, look, I think they're in a tough spot, right? Like they, they understand that, you know, they need to hit a certain level of growth target. Now we can debate what that should be or what it's likely to be. I think we have a good clip from uh, my friend Leela Mill over at China Beige Book on that particular topic. You know, that number is coming down and it's coming down sustainably over the, the long term. Now they don't need to, they don't know, they don't need or want it to crash. It do no one any good in Beijing to have Chinese growth fall off a cliff. And so they're going to do and tinker whatever tools they can tinker with. The problem is, 
And this is what I was trying to say earlier, is that for whatever reason, in this particular growth slowdown that we're engaged in China, we have simply not seen the kind of response we've seen in previous growth slowdowns. Now, why is that? Maybe it's a tacit admission that you know China is sort of getting further and further, closer and closer to the brink of the abyss from a leverage cycle perspective in the sense that it can no longer continue extending credit um, at the cost and at the supply um, to continue capitalizing you know, what is very unproductive investment. Um, it's proven to be unproductive investment. And if you look at Chinese uh, inflation statistics, which I think you know the headline CPI is somewhere around 1.5%, core CPI is somewhere around 1, 1, 2.2%. 2, if you look at their inflation statistics, they look more like Japan than they do like most emerging market economies. And you can make the case that a lot of the sort of overbuilding of property supply, the overbuilding of the manufacturing capacity that we've seen in the prior two, two and a half decades uh, has really been something that's kind of weighing on the Chinese inflation and nominal growth in China. And so at the end of the day, I think they're well aware of the longer term implications of continuing to, you know, kind of, for lack of a better term, build empty cities, you know, build on productive capacity from a manufacturing standpoint. And so I think they're reluctant to do that, which means they're just going to continue to do what they can to put a floor under growth and maybe kind of tilt it back towards the upside, but certainly not kind of do anything that would cause a kind of a reflationary boom across the global economy. Yeah, indeed. So actually, you know, uh, uh, let's take a look at that clip um, of Leland Miller from uh, China Beige Book um, CEO. Um, this was a uh, interview from uh, 19th with uh, Maggie Lake on the plus and pro tiers. So let's take a look at that clip. But in China, they want to they want to rule forever. So the, the party is much more focused on the structural problems in the economy in a way that Western analysts don't even pretend to understand. And so they are stepping in to change the economic growth model. They're changed it already. It's happening right now. All these growth projections about growth going down a tenth of a percentage point in 2025, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. We're, do, we're in a new regime, and we need to treat it like a new regime, and we need to have the expectations about China's role in the world and China's growth numbers that are concomitant with that understanding going forward. All right, so that was Leland Miller and Maggie Lake. Um, Leland Miller, once again, from the China Beige Book CEO. Um, that airs uh, for, on April 19th for the plus and pro tiers uh, for Real Vision. Um, so let me just um, now just kind of pivot over to uh, Brian. If you put up chart three uh, that I have, the reason that I'm talking about China, we're, we're talking about China um, as it relates to BOJ and the, the yen this is just a chart of dollar yen and the 10 year US Treasury yield, which we all know this chart. They basically mirror one another. Um, and then, as well as, I also threw CNY JPY, so um, Chinese yuan yen cross rate. And that, like, sort of, you know, like peak that you see, and then that kind of reverse on plummet, that peak point right there, that is when uh, the Bank of Japan announced first announced their latest round of fixed rate operations, which have been running for, uh, what is it now, six consecutive days. Um, and it, and then and, and that basically ends those, those fixed rate operations to buy an unlimited amount of JGB tens, uh, at a yield of 25 basis points that ends, uh, as of today, later today, which is going to be BOJ day, which is also the last trading day before Japan goes on a very long holiday and the world is absent, uh, the world's largest, um, you know, foreign capital allocator uh, amidst all this. So we are in very interesting times ahead. Uh, Darius, what do you make of what's coming within, I guess, the next, you know, 24, 48 hours, the BOJ meeting, basically, and, and, and the market response um, potential? I mean, if they were going to change the yield curve control policy, they're doing it in the worst possible way. They certainly would do, you know, they're doing it in the way that would create the most amount of financial market volatility and create the most destabilizing impact across the global financial markets. So um, we have a view that they're they're not going to. I mean, we obviously got a pretty strong message from Governor Kuroda a couple times last week, actually, uh, in terms of renewing their commitment to uh, yield curve control. I mean, again, this just goes back to it's not about what these people want to do. It's what they have to do. The inflation dynamics in Japan continue to be well shy of the, the Bank of Japan's target, and they continue to um, obviously have some, some very uh, struggles, some big struggles in terms of achieving those objectives. And so until they achieve the objectives, which at least according to our forecast over the next 12-month time horizon, they're not going to achieve their inflation target. 
And so they're very likely to maintain yield curve control unless there's some sort of political objective in Japan that comes down the pike um, that is, you know, just very against, you know, the, the speed and pace of the yen depreciation. But we put up a chart last week um, and we tweeted out, actually it might have been two weeks ago, uh, where we're showing the kind of relative um, volatility in the Japanese yen relative to prior um, um, intervention cycles. And we're nowhere near the kind of volatility we've seen on average in prior intervention cycles. So we continue to be uh, pretty steadfast in our belief that, you know, it's going to be mum, mum's the word with respect to yield curve control and on um, the yen depreciation that we're seeing in this cycle. Yeah. So first of all, I got to applaud you again on that chart because it was awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so I was like, I was looking, I was like, oh, this is so, so simple. Why did I think of this? And I was like, oh, it's because uh, then I remember. Oh, no. I'm trying to keep up with you, man. Your there. charts have been killer. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you, if you haven't seen that chart, it's, it's, um, I, I have it on my, my, uh, my Twitter feed, but basically, you know, um, he, what Darius basically tracked was just the, the historic, uh, moments in which you would, have, which there were, you know, yen intervention from top down policy, um, you know, direct and manner. Uh, and realized volatility of um, of of the yen, and the reason that we're looking at it from that angle is not be is because we're not you know the the level of the yen in and of itself is not does not matter is not does not matter to policymakers really doesn't even matter to, to that much to uh, you know the, the corporates and and the the investors are like it's the speed and the volatility and the sort of you know the velocity of the move uh, that's that's concerning so that's why you're looking at real as well and we are very far off from those other historic times in which we did this uh, in which they did some you know sort of intervention uh, I was on a Twitter spaces um, yesterday um, or I guess about 24 hours ago or so with uh, um, with Ash and with Jim Bianco discussing this and um, you know what I was saying too about yen devaluation um, is that Fine. There, there may come a time where that happens, right? But before that happens, it's of my view that the Japanese authorities, by which I mean the Ministry of Finance and not the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Japan does not do the FX, um, you know, it's not in the remit, um, FX intervention. Um, so that, that's the Ministry of Finance. But before they, like, intervene in, in like, currency... What you're likely going to see chronologically is you're going to probably see a dialing back of this actual severe intervention they're doing in the rate market, in the in the JGB market, totally. um, rather than continue on with this extreme intervention in the JGB market and then also throw on an additional you know, intervention in, in the, the currency market. They're probably going to dial it back first before they, you know, uh, before they, they go there with the, with like intervening with the yen. And if, and when, uh, or should that day come, it's going to be a, a very globally coordinated sort of thing. Um, it's not just going to be something that they just do under the table. Um, they're going to have to get their G5, you know, counterparties uh, together. And it's going to be something that everybody recognizes that like this is just this is more than just like about you know oh like you have competitive advantage something like, like this is this is bad for everybody if should this sort of continue, um, and we're you know we're we're not I don't see us getting to that point. Um, also want to say to um, Darius with regards to um, your uh, outlook um, or four two macros outlook on like Japan inflation and all that and CPI, even if like at this point even if like you your models uh, were showing them reaching above that 2% CPI mark um, in the next 12 months. And I'm saying 12 months because Governor Kuroda's tenure ends in 12 months. Um, the, it, the, the, the whole, like the whole policy is for it to sustain and maintain above that. So you can't just tap into, you know, above 2% once and then oh, yeah. call it a day of yield curve control. And so there's not enough time even for them to ditch yield curve control based on those, um, you know the, the the like metrics that they laid out, or the the qualifications they laid out for them to abandon. You know their 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 easing policy. And and this is why this is why we spend so much time, sort of helping investors understand and contextualizing the growth cycle, separate and apart from the inflation cycle, separate and apart from the liquidity cycle, separate and apart from the positioning cycle, which is the buy side sort of response to all three of those different cycles. They're all moving independently of each other. But they all sort of have reflexive impacts upon one another. And at the end of the day, you know, the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance in Japan are first and foremost are going to be on the lookout for maintaining, you know, the the the, the houses in order in the Japanese economy. And right now, at least with respect to uh, the inflation um, mandate, 
they're nowhere near achieving that objective. So we should not expect any material change in their policy mix. Rhetoric is rhetoric, but um, actions are actions. Indeed, indeed. So um, let's just go to questions, uh, Darius. Um, so this is from Oliver uh, from the exchange. Uh, I'd love to know what this dynamic duo's take is. I don't know who the du who the other duo is uh, on DXY uh, and what effect uh, it's having on on markets. So I guess DXY is has just broken through. Um, I don't know another multi year level um, today. Euro is getting destroyed. DXY is you know majority euro. But what what's your take on that? Yeah, so I mean we we track the BBDXY, the Bloomberg Dollar Index. It's a little bit more of a thoughtful basket in terms of. You know, accurately weighting the um the the components in the basket relative to the uh, the trade flows across the various regions, uh, and that's been making new highs for for quite some time. You know, it's on a multi-year uh, high, and so with you know, if you think about the tightening of financial conditions we've seen thus far year to date, it's really been kind of through two three main channels. Really, it's been through a decline or sort of increase in in dollar and in, in strong dollar, and then it's been through sort of a widening of credit spreads and an increase in interest rates. You know, up until this most recent kind of three or four trading days, four or five trading days, you hadn't really seen a tightening of financial conditions materially um, in sort of equity valuations, equity risk premia. We're obviously, start, we're obviously starting to see that, but there's a lot of sort of space for that to ca play catch up to things like credit spreads, things like uh, interest rates, mortgage rates, et cetera. I mean, I got a couple of charts I think are important to highlight. Um, you know, we'll start with mortgage rates, Brian. Um, if you pull that chart up with the blue line in the top panel shows, uh, the the mortgage rate, the national mortgage rate, as far back as we can get the data, the red line in the top panel just shows the uh, NAHB housing market uh, survey. Uh, typically, what you see, you know, when you have these big upside deviations in mortgage rates, the middle panel just shows the trailing three-year uh, Z-score in terms of mortgage rates. And so right now, I think this is a, the biggest rise we've ever seen on the trailing three-year Z-score basis in mortgage rates. And historically, those those kind of three sigma type moves have historically correlated to, um, you know, kind of breakdowns in housing market activity. And we continue to get that um, through the data. But yesterday we got new home sales down 13% year over year, pending home sales today down 8% year over year. Um, the second chart I'd like to show and as it relates to the, the tightening of financial conditions we've seen year to date is credit yields, Brian. Well, that chart where we show uh, the Bloomberg corporate uh, aggregate index so for all um, both high yield and investment grade uh, corporate credit outstanding in the U.S., and we're showing it on a yield to worst basis. And we're also showing that in this middle panel in terms of trailing three score, three years z-score basis. And what you're seeing here is a near three sigma rise in credit uh, in credit yields and in, in the cost of credit um, for, for corporates in, in, in this country. And so historically, those three sigma type moves have coincided with big drawdowns in ISM manufacturing PMI, which we know is highly correlated to you know risk asset returns, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's my, kind of my long-winded way of saying, hey, the financial condition we've already seen thus far, even though the Fed has only hiked interest rates 25 basis points on the Fed funds rate and has shrunk its balance sheet by all of zero dollars thus far, even though it's then the forward guidance function that's caused these moves in mortgage rates, that's caused these moves in credit yields, that's caused this move in the dollar, and that those moves are real. They will have a material impact on slowing the economy in the quarters ahead. And all the Fed is really doing at this point is really just confirming and corroborating what's already priced into money markets. Yeah, um, and because Tim uh, from the RV side actually asked about HYG, um, and you know it's it's plummeting. Um, what I'll say about that too, and as and again tying it right back into BOJ, just pull up a chart of HYG and then throw a chart of uh, put JPY USD, or you could do USD JPY inverted. Uh, on top of it, and you might see partially what the answer is. What I'm basically saying is that the um, that that lack of you know Japanese buyers um, of they don't just buy cre you know treasuries. They buy credit. They buy like you know credit. They buy like horrible credit. Um, they're they're in search of yield, and so uh, if they're pulling back from those markets um, or they're not deploying capital that normally would be otherwise um, on, on, on sort of a seasonal uh, basis, you know, uh, Brian, if you actually uh, pull up uh, chart uh, number one, um, you know, you'll you'll see that uh, I'm sorry, chart number two, Brian, uh, you'll you know, if you if 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 it, Japanese investors are not deploying capital into the U.S. Treasury market, as well as into, you know, U.S. Uh, credit and European credit and all that, you're going to see um, sell offs um, in things like HYG. 
Um, now, this chart that uh, I have pulled up, this is just sort of a year to date um, of where we stand in terms of, you know, the the, the events the, the on, on the horizon and the events in the past. And you'll see basically that dollar yen and tre treasury yield just, you know, shoot upwards starting in March, going right into fiscal year end um, for Japan. And uh, that at that this point last year, at the same exact point, that was the reversal. Um, April 1st was the reversal for the spike in U.S. Treasury yields and the spike in U.S. Uh, dollar yen as, you know, uh, the fiscal year, like new fiscal year started, redeployment of capital, buying of treasuries and, and all that kind of stuff put, brought yields back down. This time it didn't happen because of the insanity and, in you know, with, with the currency, as well as hedging costs that were taking out, you know, the yields for premium between the U.S. and Japan. But we are now upon, um, you know, golden week. We have one trading day left. We have a Bank of Japan meeting um, at 12 noon in a few hours. Um, and then after market close is the real meeting with, um, you know, BOJ Governor Kuroda. Uh, and that's, again, after market close. And then after that, Japan is out, off uh, off the grid for the next, you call it six trading days or, you know, uh, 11 days, you know, uh, the total. And so there's going to be very interesting sort of things that could potentially happen. Uh, my potential, my view is that they're not going to actually change anything, but they're going, they're probably going to announce a policy review for the next meeting, uh, for the next BOJ meeting, um, and that gives them sort of fle flexibility to do something or, or not. But markets are probably going to take that uh, as a widening out of the um, of the ban. Um, yeah, if they if they announce a policy review, that's going to be carnage in the bond market globally. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah, very well, very well could be. The, yeah. the, the other thing too is that um, you know you might see some stability in, in the. So I'm also suspecting that currently this past week at least, and we'll get we're gonna get this data in a few um, hours as well before Japan market open. But I think that you're gonna see Japan actually started buying, started to deploy their capital overseas this past week. So you're probably going to see foreign bond uh, investing uh, out of Japan like drastically tick up um for for this week and that's why you see a you know that recorrelation of dollar yen and uh uh treasury yields as, as well uh we'll, we'll see about that but yeah Derek's absolutely right if they if the if they don't even have to do anything they just need to hint at uh policy review the markets will take that as okay they're going to widen out this band to i don't know oh, 50 yeah. basis points whatever it is it'll be a rate hike sort of uh equivalent absolutely. in terms of market sort of reaction and that's going to be absent Japan's uh, reaction too. Keep that in mind. Whatever happens or doesn't happen in markets, that's not the full reaction. That is the, the reaction absent the actual Japan's uh, Japanese investors' uh, reaction because of Golden Week. Um, Darius, do you have any um, any last words before we head into BOJ, um, the, the the first meaningful BOJ meeting in in years? Yeah, cash is king. <laughs> Uh, yen? <laughs> like, d define cash. <laughs> define Maybe cash. Yen. Preferably <laughs> dollar-based cash or tether-based cash for my crypto friends out there, but um, I think we can all figure it out <laughs> what to do with that that statement. Yeah, ca cash is king unless you're um, based where I am, in which case it's not. Uh, <laughs> it's cash is trash. <laughs> you are. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I'm saying define it. You can't just say, yeah. you can't just blindly throw out this, this general term cash. Uh, cash is a very buy, different buy thing. some Japanese stocks, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, or, or pay my heating bill. Um, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, thanks for watching uh, the the Real Vision Daily briefing. I'll, I'll do an update on, on Twitter and all that. Um, make sure you're following Darius as well. Um, you know for BOJ updates. Ash Bankton will be back tomorrow uh, with Peter Bookfar. Um, in the meantime, check out Real Vision's uh, newest podcast, The Next Big Trade, with uh, Harry Melandry. Um, so Harry will talk to some of the world's you know foremost traders about like current trends in markets and what they believe is uh, a smart bet. All right. So uh, enjoy. And Here's thanks a lot, Darius. Thank you. Welcome to the next big trend. Welcome to the next big trade. On this program, I'll talk to some of the world's foremost traders about current trends in markets and what they believe is a smart bet. My next big trade is Tesla and Tesla being the king of the climate change impactful companies that an investor can invest in and think about over the next decade, what they will hopefully accomplish will, will be monumental.
and probably even be bigger than what Apple has accomplished. Yeah, my forecasts are not going to change whether the Green Deal gets approved or doesn't get approved. If you don't have a planet, you won't care who invades who. It's completely irrelevant. The bond market has two jobs. It's all they need to do is future inflation and future growth. That's it. So when you've got only got two variables to look at, you're most likely that the outcome of the hive mind of bond investors are going to reach the right kind of consensus. I've only seen consensus wrong once in my entire career, and that was 1994, when the bond market blew up. Other than that, the bond consensus has always been right.